This is a sick joke on us. It's a sick joke on us. But it's something off about that house. So, Sean, how would you describe this movie to the audience? I would describe it as um, a tragedy, horror tragedy, if that's the term, um, about a mother who lost her daughter but was too focused on her career and not focused on the things that should matter in life, the people around her, um, the man she used to have, her new husband who is in the movie, and especially with her daughter. Um, she didn't appreciate her family having a daughter. And so when she's pushed into her career, the first actual haunting that she experiences is her daughter. So, yeah. Well, that's creepy. <laughs> yeah. What was the inspiration for this movie? It was less actual films and more uh, video game horror. Um, there were a lot of. Oh, uh, yeah, that's cool. Of, yeah. Like, um, I love movies. Um, but I would almost say that if I was born in the 2010s mm -hmm. or if I was born now, I might have actually gotten into video game development. But as someone that was born in the 80s, um, you know, most of the development for games I was playing was out in Japan. Like there was a lot of computer gaming in America, but most of like the heavy hitters from Sega, Nintendo, all that were out in Japan. And it was just a different um I was either not as, um, you know, naive or whatever. Like I didn't understand it. Oh, I thought, you know, computers uh, mm -hmm. it would be too technical and less of a narrative. Um, computer gaming certainly was in the 80s and 90s um, was more developed than video games from Japan. But yeah, I would say the inspirations for this, um, a lot of the Sierra games like King's Quest, um, obviously, I, I think I borrowed a bit with uh, the title being the third guest, stuff like the seventh guest, Myst, uh, Phantasmagoria, all those uh, Roberta Williams adventure games. They were heavy on narrative. And I think obviously today, like video games have you know, narrative storytellers, directors, um, and the budgets of those rival Hollywood movies, like especially mine, like the budget on this hovered, you know, we kind of went into it with like eight, nine thousand dollars all in. By the time I finished everything, we were slightly under fifty thousand all in, and that includes the lawyers and the oh, wow. and color, yeah. um, sound work. The sound work took a lot um, to get the five one mix and everything, but it was self funded by me and my producing partner. And by the end of it, we you know we were splitting the cost half fifty fifty. Um, and then, yeah, so by the end of it, like we're definitely low budget. I'm glad that we got where we, where we got, where we got. And, um, I'm, we're supposed to be having a UK, uh, DVD Blu-ray release, which should spill out into the U S I'm looking forward to see, just seeing what additional platforms are going to, or where this will land and mainly the ability to do more. Cause, um, we went into this, like I wrote the script in a week and a half like Christmas of 2019. So uh, I've been trying to make another feature for quite a while, but it's hard for people to like give you money. There are a lot of pitch meetings, um, a lot of stuff like that. I'd been working in reality television for 10 years. Um, I went to AFI, American Film Institute, and right out the gate after uh, AFI, I had you know my cinematographer, my editor, my producer, which we were all friends. And within a year or so after um, leaving AFI, we had, a movie together, American High School, which is not exactly like American Pie, but it, ha it borrowed a lot of the elements from it. Um, and it, it's the classic tale of signing bad deals or, or signing a deal that you think is good, but yeah. you know, it's hard to say like someone's going to give you $50,000, which ended up being around 200,000 to shoot that movie. Um, but, you know, it's hard it, to go off what you were saying earlier. Yeah. Like, I, I think that there are a lot of things I could touch on being in the industry for 20 years, like yeah. having some small success, um, but you know, a lot of lows, however, recently, you know, doing a lot of the reality TV and it's just money, like the industry works mm. off money. And so it's like I've say, said earlier, it's hard for people to give you money. So um, yeah, that film American high school, it ended up doing like 1.2 million in the U S and I, I still get residual checks from it. Like, 15, 20 years later. So 
it's still it like all the stuff like i want to be clear like i'm not saying that they're it's not four star movies not three star movies like that movie you know like one one and a half stars but it was a comedy and it ended up making a lot of money however not for me but they had a lot of reality stars in it so i kind of went into reality television uh, shooting editing pitching to networks um partially through the relationships with those reality stars, people from the hills, uh, Laguna Beach, stuff like that. Um, we had uh, uh, P. Diddy's uh, collaboration with Danny Kane, what, the Aubrey O'Day, she was in that. Um, and she happened to be on the cover of Playboy the month that we released. So that helped a bit with the sales. Um, but yeah, so so the third guest came about because we, um, my producing partner and I, like we've been making a lot of money in reality TV, but you know, we wanted to do something else together. And then in late 2019, the opportunity came about with the third partner to do another comedy. But then a couple weeks into it, she kind of backed away. And so I was in a standstill around like Christmas of 2019 when this happened. I'm like, look, I want to do something. You want to do something. We have like 20, we had at the time, I thought we had, we have like five, six thousand dollars that we can just throw at something. Let's just do something. Um, so he agreed with that. And so that's why it took um, a week and a half, two weeks to write the script. I was just hustling during that Christmas um, break in 2019. Uh, the reason why we were hustling is because he was supposed to be on a reality show February to June. So we had a small window where he was available where when we had to, if we we're gonna do it, we had to do it then. Um, and he came with people with the camera, um, some of the crew, which he had worked on from reality TV. So that's why the script took a week and a half. I think, you know, two, two years, three years after that, it would have been nice to have, you know, another couple drafts. I think um, we had two reshoots and I think the, the ending is the multiple endings was intentional, but it was, th there were definitely some narrative issues. I would say it's odd that most of the time the middle of movies is the it's the toughest to write but also it's usually the weakest part of the film is the middle and i think ours reflectively the middle is the best part and the beginning's okay the end is some of the worst but i would say like the beginning of the way this movie began wasn't how it was supposed to begin we had a sequence that we shot the reshoots where she goes into a hotel does some ghost hunting her husband's not there and she meets a creepy guy and that creepy guy did appear in the movie at the end in that last house when you have uh, Karloff, the old man, and then there's a heavy set boulder man that comes in behind him. That was originally the guy from the beginning with the creepy hotel that um, isn't in the movie. So the reason, part of the reason why Karloff targets her in particular is because um, that creepy bald guy that she meets in the beginning at the crappy hotel um, and this is just a crappy hotel in Los Angeles. You're narratively, you're supposed to see that she's like going through the motion. She doesn't believe in ghosts. She doesn't believe in ghost hunting. She's doing this for the money. She's a writer that got into ghost hunting and she's trying to, you know, make money, make her a name for herself. But she, so she knows this is all, all bull crap. Um, am I allowed to curse? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. We all do right. not, we do not censor here. Okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so she knows that this profession's full of crap. Um, and she, so she goes into this hotel for a buck. You know, I'm going to pretend to ghost hunt and write up a crappy thing on you know, websites or whatever. However, her agent makes her money doing this stuff because she's got, she doesn't like that she's gotten notoriety doing this crappy ghost hunting stuff, but it's what pays the bills. And she ultimately, she wants her name to be out there in some capacity. So this fulfills that void. And that's what I mentioned earlier, like she should be, you know, focus on the career, but she completely ignored her family. She completely ignored her daughter. And so that's what I was trying to get across throughout the movie. But for that opening, um, the creepy ball guy sees what she's doing and then puts in a phone call to Karloff, hey, there's this, uh, I think we have, I think we have a, another prospect. And what I mean by prospect, um, this Karloff guy, he, I, I think I borrowed this from like a Star Trek episode. Somewhere. <laughs> Karloff takes the, like Karloff likes artists 
-hmm. He likes people with a lot of passion, like this character, uh, like the main character in Third Guest. She, they like, um, Karloff is an artist as well. He's like a uh, magician from the, from the 1900s. Um, he's obviously still alive. He's, I, I don't know if it's clear if he's like a mortal or whatever he's actually tapped into. Like he's a magician, charlatan, kind of like um, Evie, the character in Third Guest is kind of a charlatan with the ghost hunting. However, Karloff in his lifetime did tap into something arcane. Um, in the 1900s, which makes him immortal. So the whole setup, which we shot during the reshoots, and it should be on the DVD. It's like a six minute sequence where she comes into the hotel, does her ghost hunting, the creepy guy, uh, Evie comments to Hart on the phone. Hart is her husband. She comments to him on the phone, wow, that guy was so creepy, blah, blah, blah. And then we see, um, and I, I didn't know at the time if I was gonna shoot, um, as I shot the creepy ball guy talking to Carl off, hey, I think we have another one, stuff like that. I wasn't sure if I was gonna use that or not, um, but I, sh I shot that anyway. But unfortunately that whole sequence, as I was editing the movie, it was slow and it it's a six minute sequence that kind of, you know, you open the movie and it's it was shot in a rushed state because it was during the reshoots we had a lot to do that day so ultimately it got cut and then the beginning of the movie as it is in the release is that little um sizzle reel showing what they are and all that that was supposed to take place like 10 minutes into the movie so after that whole hotel thing she's calling hard on the phone they say oh, okay well we have another job from from arn our agent let's go to his office and see what that's about and then we go into the scene that starts the movie, um, that starts the movie for real. But the reason why I start the movie the way it started is because it's high energy and you kind of get what these people are about from that sizzle reel thing, like either goes to yeah. or Arn gives him a job. So yeah, that was, a, a, I do like that sequence. And I think that um, in a parallel dimension or, you know, scientifically, people are parallel dimensions and alternate dimensions, I think are becoming more like, Hey, this might actually be a real thing. Like in real life. Right? <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. There's yeah. Stuff. So in another alternate reality somewhere, if there's billions of them, I think there's a sequence where, um, where that original opening does exist somewhere, you know, in the release that, yeah, like it was a collective decision on everyone's part, the producers, the lead actress, myself that, Hey, we should just start the movie at that sizzle thing but mm -hmm. i do like that six minute sequence so yeah i do too and it it was funny how they responded to it because they're responding to it like you would as the audience so if, if you were in their position watching that they're like what is this super cheese and the agent's like hey how else am i supposed to sell you guys i thought that was pretty funny i liked his uh i liked Arn's candor with how he spoke to them he was so nonchalant about everything um but yeah what what worked for me was the approach that you took to it I like that you, and I think this is probably from like drawing from video games and stuff like you mentioned. I think that's really cool that you mentioned that because video games, I love video games and I get totally immersed in the storytelling of video games. And I think that they get neglected and they don't get nearly enough praise for how good video games are in their storytelling and how kind of complex they are and how much time a video game it's almost like kind of like a mini series with a video game how much time they have to expand the story for it but it's really cool i mean that's what makes you play for like eight hours and you get super addicted to it because you get so immersed in that but that's great you know all those things that you mentioned on there but this is what i think is cool is that the illusionist angle of it is something that you don't normally see in ghost stories and i think it's important for indie filmmakers to think outside the box and kind of think like okay here's a ghost story and so when I started watching it, I was like, hey, where's he going to go with this? I did not see like the illusionist angle coming at all too. And it was sort of reminded me a little bit of kind of little elements of, um, remember that Clive Barker movie, Lord of Illusions with the magician yeah. and the stuff back yeah. in it? I kind of started reminding me of that a little bit, like that setup for it. But since you did that, you allow people to get creeped out, whether they're in daylight which is probably awesome because it saves budget. And since these characters are getting inside of his mind, like Karloff is telling him, you are inside of a piece of my mind right now. It makes it so they can't really escape. So they can't really run away. Even if they can get away, 
they can't really go anywhere because he can always stay in his mind. It all depends on like how long his range is, like how long he can like teleport himself to or teleport them to be in his mind. But I thought that was cool because I think it it allows the format for horror to expand where you can get tormented and haunted wherever you go or whether there's daylight or whatever the setting is. You don't have to be in that creepy cabin for it to happen. You can be anywhere and he can attack you. Yeah, and that's more true to life. Like as I, when I was writing the script, um, my initial premise thought was that I know we're not gonna have a lot of budget, but like what was the what is like the truest horror in real life? And I think it would be if the person you love is the villain, quote unquote. Like, and you you need you need to have like when you're writing something, you need to have range. So like you start in one place and like, what's the most extreme angle you could go in the opposite direction. So to the start would be, they're a very happily married couple, they love each other. And the extreme of that is the guy turns on her, is, you know, attacks her, betrays love, betrays trust. And like the biggest thing in marriage is trust. So I knew I wanted to do a husband wife and they turn on each other. Um, and yeah, and I, a lot, I, I guess it doesn't show up with my previous filmmaking, but I've had a lot of failed movies and failed pitches that involve young children because um, I, I do a lot of uh, charity work for, in particular, the Child's Play um, video game charity. So I, I like to work with children. I think they're a lot more, they, they, they can be, they have the potential to be scene stealers, but they, they have a lot of, uh, there's a pure innocence and less of, oh, I'm acting or it's the craft and more just like they, have, they come across better on screen, in my opinion. Like I, I did a bunch of work in England and that's kind of how this started um, before I went to AFI and we're talking 20 years ago, but that's kind of how it got introduced to me that I was working um, at the university I was at in England and got involved with some child actors in England and, you know, that like, wow, you guys are amazing. And so yeah that's cool yeah because kids have that like they don't have that filter they don't have that filter like am i messing this up or there aren't those other like thoughts like that go into uh, your mind like when you're an adult like you have those doubts or whatnot you're always questioning yourself they just yeah they're just totally um they don't have like those years of of experience of like making mistakes and things like that so it is like it is without a, a filter where you get more of kind of like an honest performance yeah cool if you yeah if you find the, the right actor for it absolutely it really nails yeah. it I think the, the 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 young actress in this, and it, it's odd that like like when you see her now, she's like almost a teenager. It, it seems yeah. odd. The, the 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 time that people grow, like, because it's it was three years since we shot it, and like her name's Logan Laurel, and they moved up to Texas, and I see she has she's had like five years or five uh she has five more movies since the one that, uh, oh, that yeah. We, yeah, I would say oh, her. her I, I like that a lot, and the older gentleman who played Karloff, Joseph Lopez, he, he's been around for decades and like he's done like, t you know, I want to say almost a hundred movies. Like, uh, so the fact that he agreed to do this, I, I think without a doubt, like he is, um, you know, he comes across the strongest and it was always a pleasure working with him. I did another film with him since then. And yeah, he's always, uh, I, I think he gets, he and, and Ken, it's good that um, you know the way he portrayed Karloff as the villain. Like I'm immensely happy. Like he he makes the whole movie without him being strong or whatever. Then it's uh, then it would all fall fall apart. So I think whatever mistakes I made as a director, or writer, producer, you know, every going through this, like he was the glue that stuck it together. If I oh like. As a, for instance, like all the stuff I, of him, like you just shoot his face in the woods and it's creepy. And he does. <laughs> it's true. Like, yeah. like, so I, there was a lot, there was one take where I had him in my bathroom and it was just an extreme close up of his face. And that's some of the last stuff that we shot during the original shoot. And I just have him for a minute or so laughing and stuff in extreme close up just in my bathroom. You can't tell it's a bathroom wall behind him. But I constantly cut back to that stuff. Um, and it's just a minute of his face, like laughing and, and screaming and stuff. And I, I end up using that kind of stuff constantly in the movie. Oh, yeah, definitely. No, he has an absolute screen presence. That guy doesn't even have to say anything. Just put him in the movie. He can speak a thousand words. His face has like totally he's lived through stuff. He's got, uh, yeah, you can tell he's 
been through all kinds of things and has had like a million stories to tell. Kind of like when you look at a guy like that, it sort of reminds you of that Ray Bradbury book, The Illustrated Man, where like all over the body, there's all those tattoos that tell different stories. You can tell he's probably got a lot of different stories and things he's lived through. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, but he's the nicest guy too. Like, yeah, he, he looks like, like I was saying with the creepy ball guy earlier, like this yeah. guy looks like a movie villain and he yeah. has like toss and everything but but like on set in person he's like the nicest gentleman like most people are you know they're walking around chatting you know he's like in this in his chair like observing people and i guess that that shows like the level of of professionalism or whatever like he's seen in a chair waiting for people to come to him and like when i'm done with certain takes i'm walking by like i'm seeing people just sit him he's just People see him sitting in a chair, they just are naturally drawn to him. So they're just going to come over and talk to him rather than he coming and talking to people. So he was immensely great to work with throughout the whole production. So I, I'm going to keep working with him with whatever I do, because he, he's a diamond in the rough that people should definitely know Joseph Lopez more. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, him and the daughter are both great. Yeah. They, and speaking of names like that name, Karloff, um, kind of reminds me of like, so when when you write movies, you have like certain things in mind for names. Because I was, because like before we were talking, I was like, Cannon of Patrick Cannon, he's got to be Irish. And I was, I was looking up, uh, look up your name and it was said like Discipline or like Wolf Cub. There's a couple of different things. Are, are you um, mostly Irish or? Um, I'm like half Italian. Oh, really? Okay. Albanian, Kim Kardashian. And- <laughs> Like the, I am like an eighth Irish from my dad's side, but I think they just like the name. Okay, yeah. But yeah. My dad's side is a like English, Irish, Scottish, and they came over like not in the Mayflower, but they came over like a, a um, long, long time ago. And like half my dad's, so long ago that like half my dad's family was fighting for the South, and the other half were fighting for the North in the Civil War. And, oh, wow. Like, yeah, like my dad's family were hardcore military for like generations, generations. My dad was a lieutenant commander in the Navy. Um, and then I'm the first generation out of like, what is that, like eight or nine generations? Like no military, no nothing. I go into filmmaking and all that. So but, oh, yeah. that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, I think like the meaning behind names and everything is fascinating. So do you um, do you do like do you specifically have like an intent for when you name characters? Oh, uh, well, um, Karloff. Uh, again, going back to video games, I think there was an old video game character named Karnoff, and he was like a, like for the old NES, and he was like a, um, has nothing to do with our Karloff, because he's like a, a mustached, bald, like um, wrestler guy that like beat, punches and beats up people. But I just like the name Karnoff, um, so I just switched it up a little bit, and yeah, I needed something uh something yeah and i think it also came from one of those uh, um sierra adventure games too that that the um they also did a play on karnoff i think because it's video game related but yeah so that, that's it so it kind of came from an amalgamation of uh, that kind of stuff yeah i was just curious it i it i just i thought of boris right away when when i heard oh, that yeah. So that's, yeah so that's what I was, what I was wondering yeah but i just i love like the whole like uh, kind of like getting into names and kind of like meanings behind naming characters and movies um okay let's see here oh yeah okay since this is a ghost story i'm curious about this have you had any kind of personal experience with hauntings yourself my brother used to be a ghost hunter no um, kidding wow yeah I, I, but that was after um, college and everything. So I never actually went with him on any of it. Um, but he was involved in, he had a, a, a group that he was, he's in Connecticut. So he, and he had a group that did all that stuff. And like, he said that he has some recordings of some stuff. I haven't heard it, but me personally, um, I guess I'm more like when I try to write my lead characters, they're kind of like me in a way, like I, don't have a child or anything like that but in terms of the skepticism and the like oh this is all fake kind of stuff like that would be more me like i i think that the energy from people when they pass away is certainly like there what like speaking to my dad before like my dad um had my dad ended up passing away in the hotel room um so this was a while ago 
but yeah, like when he did pass in that hotel room, it, it, there might be an energy or something that's lingering there because it wasn't, he didn't intend to pass away in that room. Um, and my brother went there to get his stuff. I was in California at the time. I flew back to, um, back to New Jersey where we grew up um, for the funeral and everything. But my brother had a difficult time going in there and get my dad's things, stuff like that. Just because at the time, that's when he was knee deep in the ghost hunting. And I think he actually, that was the reason, or a reason, I haven't specifically talked to him about this, but I think that's one of the reasons why he stopped doing the ghost hunting, just being in that experience. Cause you know, he had, he had to go to the hotel, you know, get his car, get his things, stuff like that. So, yeah. So, so he probably is like, oh, okay. You know, there's definitely some, some energy here um but yeah i guess we you just hope that for real ghosts whatever like maybe there's some time where you're confused you don't know what to do and eventually they'll you know i don't think ghosts from like egypt or greece from two three thousand years ago that they're still here i think there's probably residual energy somewhere and then maybe eventually they'll you know figure out what to do and for some people it might take a day or two for some people it might take five years Maybe, you know, World War II ghost um, sightings or battlefield Gettysburg uh, ghost sightings, maybe for some people it takes 100 years. Um, yeah, I think I think that's really just all it is that if people need extra time to figure out what it is you know, before they go. And some people are longer or shorter than others, like with the near death, not near, near the near death experience, but when people are on hospital beds and they die. And then they see themselves, you know, floating up and they see their body on the, on the table and the doctor's operating and then they fix them. And they, when they wake up, they can tell like what was going on. Um, I forget, I, I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing that story, but, um, and the doctors were saying, there's no way they could have known that because they were passed out, you know, dead at the time. But the, the person when they are resuscitated can remember that stuff so i i think that there's certainly something to it but like the ghost as like an apparition that's trying to terrify you or whatever i don't think that that i don't think that residual energy has enough um intelligence to interact with us i think it's just our minds that playing on you know if we see something we're going to interpret it in different ways yeah. yeah well i had i i played a ouija board. there was i played a ouija board a couple of times there's one night when we played it there were several people there one girl was using it and it was spinning around so fast in her hands and she was saying things they were like how is she coming up with this stuff and it was flying like that movie called a uh, witch board when you see the board kind of like spin around and then it stops we were witnessing that and i was i felt like such a dark energy in the room i was like i have no idea what's going on but i'm not playing this again it just and ever since then i was like kind of when watching horror movies with um with like supernatural themes or whatnot there's a primal part of me that connects with it because of that and it's just weird it's it's like that sort of an unknown thing like none of us really know what's going on but there's some kind of like energy or some kind of presence and sometimes it's dark or sometimes it's or sometimes it's evil or sometimes it's good let's just hope there's more ghosts like um casper that are out there than that uh than that one from the exorcist hope they hope these still aren't around <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I guess I'm backtracking on what I said earlier because yeah, I guess those some of those things, if they are around, then maybe they're pissed that they can't leave. So then that's that's why. I just think that it's mostly our intelligence playing against us. Most of these things might just be yeah, because I personally have never witnessed anything, and I think like the main character in Third Guest, she wouldn't, you know, unless she actually witnesses something, and then in our movie when she starts to hear things and stuff in the house she's immediately thinking someone's trying to mess with her which would be the logical thing to think but then when she starts to hear her daughter I'm like oh, okay do they have a recording of her um, that, that's the point of that scene when she's like flipping out in, in the in the main room like like why are they doing this why they do she has to have a, a recording but why would she have a recording how would she know who she is blah blah, blah. so yeah, I, I, it's her own mind coming to terms with like, oh, this can't be real. This can't be possible. And then it is possible for her daughter to be speaking with her. And yeah, her daughter would be angry because her mother never showed her like care and motherly love. So I would be freaked out if 
my daughter died and I was like a terrible father. And then suddenly my daughter's, you know, coming back in my face. That would be like the worst kind of haunting. Oh yeah, it? absolutely. And it would haunt you for the rest of your life too. Yeah. Kind of like what's happening to my character here. Yeah. Evie. Yeah. Cool. So what, so this movie is a change up from movies that you've made previously. So what is it about the, the horror genre that speaks to you? Well, I don't think that you can do good comedy anymore. Um, American High School was a comedy, but that was in, we shot in 2007 and you could be a lot less PC. You can be a lot more sexualized. And I think that like, even me talking about it, it's hard to like, I don't want to trip over my words or say the wrong thing. Cause like, and that's just comedy now. Like, unless you're Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock. Yeah. Or like there, there, there's only a handful of people, Bill Burr, like it, there's only a handful of people that can like say things and not get canceled or, or so I don't think it's, you can do comedy. There are comedies, but they, I, in my opinion, it's very filtered and watered down and you, you can't say or offend or and that's what comedy is. Like you're making fun of yourself and you're offending people and you're, not being mean spirited, there is a fine line between mean, mean spirited or racist or sexist or bigoted than actual comedy. But I think the funniest comedy is when you're like blurring the line in a way that like Ricky Gervais comedy, like yeah. instance, that, like calling out everyone in Hollywood and just some of the things he's saying, like, you know, that he's not a sexist pervert. He has a very nice relationship with a woman for decades. Like, you know, that that's not like it's comedy so um in terms of low budget stuff you have comedy you have horror like i can't i can't make john wick five i don't have the budget for that i can't do like sweeping dramas or um so comedy i've done you know, I've, there's american high school there's a bunch of other short films and web series stuff like that where i've explored that enough and maybe in a couple of decades i'll do comedy again but horror is another thing where you can do a lot with low budget and you, you can have a 20, $30 million horror movie, like scream six things. You can have a you know, scream 20 scream 30, like that has, you know, big stars and, and you know, the same kind of horror elements, but you can have something like us for 25,000, or I think the ideal budget is around what we did for American high school around 200,000, 300,000. That way you can get, you know, SAG actors that come in and they're looking to do like a meaty project and you have relationships with people like two, 300,000 is enough to like get a solid cast, get a solid camera, move into a location and do something, you know, special that can make a lot of money. Um, so to answer your question, like I wanted to do a horror thing just to see if I could do it effectively. And I think, honestly, I think I failed more than I, um, succeeded with this one but a lot of that's just you know the fact that covid ha happened we shot this you know like i mentioned with my timeline earlier we shot this january of 2020 covid was around but no one knew about it like i think 75 percent into production i started getting news articles and stuff like hey there's a something like a virus or whatever like and I kind of thought about it like SARS, like, okay, okay, whatever, I'm going to go shoot. And then like a week after we finished shooting is when everything started getting on the lockdown. So, so yeah, um, I think I would definitely do horror again. Like I'm, I, I think just based on me being a um, little ambivalent about doing comedy for the reasons I said before, um, I think when the landscape shifts, I might try to go back, but I would love to do, like I shot another horror movie since this. And uh, since this movie, I've also gotten married and my wife and I are, you know, in the process of forming a production company to do more. So, yeah. So, yeah, like I, I do, I like this environment for the reasons that you said too, that you can do a lot with a little, with an illusionary environment. Um, and it's just a matter of me spending more than two weeks to write a script and like just, more better more preparation kind of kind of going off on on that um and this could be like just any genre in general how did filmmaking get into your blood um i started wanting to be an actor just kid in new jersey watching all the uh, big budget stuff i never used to watch independent movies um i say that with 
naivete and like I'm not some art, artist of the craft or I'm going to watch you know all, all these great movies in the past like I come into it from a um, I got into this because every weekend I would watch movies with my dad and the movies he wanted to watch were you know Tom Cruise big budget you know Top Gun type stuff like and I was a kid so every weekend going there it was like there the, the movies in the 80s and 90s to me, I'm an old man now, but it's so much better than the crap that's being put out today. Like, I agree completely. Know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were less movies out there, but the movies that were made, like the, the, the care that went into everything, you know, making models, making matte paintings, making set pieces, and um, it's not done anymore. It's, so, yeah, I, I think now independent movies have like i can get the same camera as someone that's making a 50 million dollar movie like it's i can get the same lenses the same cameras i'm using the same programs like premiere pro avid using the same exact thing and that didn't exist decades ago like i would say when i got into college and started to teach myself filmmaking it um like it sort of started to change like oh i don't need a steinbeck thing to edit i don't need um, you know, film cameras were super expensive. It was some like foreign language that no one, had, oh, who has a film camera, you have to be a nerd to have like an actual 16 millimeter film camera. When those uh, uh, digital cameras that were around when you and I were growing up, like you can't shoot and release a movie on that unless you expect, okay, this is a handy cam movie that's going to go nowhere because there was no internet back then. So where are you gonna distribute this and all that stuff? So, so yeah, like I, so, to get back to what you said before, I wanted to be an actor. And then when it came time to say, okay, what am I gonna do with my life? I was a high school kid, um, no girlfriend, no like shy nerd, um, plays video games, writes some stuff. And then when I got into theater, it opened me up um, like it does for a lot of people in my situation that gets in the theater. I didn't have girlfriends, but I was hanging out with like the prettiest girls in high school. They were all doing theater together. They all left because they were a year or two older than me, but I stuck with it just because suddenly I had friends, I had an environment that you know, was nurturing, that it wasn't competitive at all. It was um, inclusive in the small theater group in high school. So when it came time, okay, what am I going to do? I'll go to college to be an actor. And I went to NYU, USC for, for auditions, NYU, NYU USC, UCLA. Um, everyone rejected me. So oh, okay, I guess maybe I'm not that great of an actor, but the best place that did accept me that didn't require an audition was Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, it's kind of like Amish country, but it was a great university, again, a very nurturing environment. I came in there as an actor, so okay, my major is theater. Um, in high school, it was mostly plays like Oscar Wilde from 1800s or, or Shakespeare in high school. I go into college, I'm doing the same exact thing, like Shakespeare, I did Macbeth, I was playing like the same character in Twelfth Night two times in a row, like once in high school, another time in college, and I did local theater as well, but having not gotten in to any of the auditions back then, um, like, hey, maybe I'm not that good of a filmmaker, around halfway through my freshman year, it's like, I'm going to graduate in three and a half years, am I going to make money, like, doing Shakespeare like I wanted to be like a Tom Cruise like a you know the people that I used to watch as a kid and like I'm not gonna this is this is like a come to Jesus moment I'm not gonna get there like I can work my ass off but like I was um, hampered or um, humbled by okay I'm just an actor the directors have to cast me in a role I could be the best Sir Andrew I could be. I could be the best tree in Macbeth that I can be, but I'm still, like, I wasn't a literal tree, but I was one of the soldiers in Macbeth that in, in freshman year in college. So we had actual, like, Christmas trees or whatever they were, and I was a soldier that had to, like, come up when the forest was coming up to Macbeth at the end of, uh, at the end of that play. So it's like, uh, I'm an, a soldier in an army of people that are way more talented than me. So the best decision I ever made uh, freshman year, I uh, stepped back from acting and there was, um, this is when digital cameras started to be available. The Franklin Marshall College invested in two 
digital cameras. They invested in a film editing lab with Final Cut Pro, the first one, and no one was using it. So I would go up to the, the film theater you know, building, talk to the professors, hey, can, am I able to rent these out? And they're like, oh, yeah, we were going to use it for a class, but they're just sitting on the desk. Go ahead and, you know, had to sign like a waiver thing that won't break it, stuff like that. So I just took the camera and then theater actors that were thinking like me, like, hey, I don't want to play a tree. All right, well, let me write you something and let's try to make a movie. And so my initial thought was I'm not going to do a short film. I want to do a full two hour feature length film, uh, which was called Lament, which is kind of like a tragedy about guy and girl in college. And it, it was not great, but it was OK. Like I spent the better part of a year, in addition to my uh, courses and stuff, just shooting this with the actors and editing, teaching myself editing. And it was a great experience because it actually got in the local newspaper. We had like a week long screen in the, there was a theater space in college. And like because of the newspaper article, I would say maybe 200 people came at, on one night. Like it was filled up because even in the year 2000, people weren't making like full fledged movies um, that you know, could be shown and released or whatever. But yeah, like it wasn't great, but that got me to the following year do another one. Um, and then after that, it's like, uh, I'm kind of um, getting too big for like, there's not much more I can grow. So then I went to Vassar, I went to Princeton University, and that's why I went to England. Every semester or two, I would do a study abroad, um, transfer student into different programs so I could take their courses. Vassar and Princeton I did because I can actually work with 16 millimeter, um, which was interesting. And I still have all that stuff and it's great. Um, but the stuff in England, I ended up staying there for over a year. And then the work I did there is what got me into AFI. So, yeah, it started as a failed actor, and I fully admit that. Um, I think I know enough about acting that helps me direct the actors. And when I say direct the actors, I think like the the you you can tell. Um, I still consider myself I'm very independent D-list director, but you can tell when a director's terrible by how much they are talking with their actors like i i'm not the george lucas do it again but faster do it again but better like i love him and i but it's well known he doesn't work well with actors and he does everything else like stellar a plus you know but i would say i do a lot of things bad but the way that i try to talk with my actors is to critique their performances as a director as i'm watching it as an actor so like you know, say a few small things, because if you're saying like, you know, paragraph or two, like I'm talking and rambling now, people aren't going to remember, you know, they're going to remember bits and pieces and words because these actors are in the middle of their process trying to get things across. So I try to do as small, the, the least amount it takes possible and say the least amount to my actors as possible while still trying to be effective and not just like, hey, do this, but you're sad or there's, a, there's so much crap that they teach you in school, like, mm -hmm. Nothing that I learned in college, um, AFI, American Film Institute, was amazing for the um, connections I made. Like the cinematographer that I worked with that shot uh, American High School, he went on to be nominated for an Oscar, and he now lives in Italy. And the editor that I used for American High School, he now edits all the Fast and Furious movies, at least the last two or three. Um, the production designer has gone on to do like a lot of um, independent work and my producing partner is worked he, he's done like 20 films in the last two three years um so what i'm trying to say is all these people were amazing but it wasn't the institution itself that helped um yeah like visiting professors at afi they were just people that came out from films and hey i'm the ad on bad lieutenant i'm gonna teach you now okay so that's partially why I, I think I, I wouldn't get along with any place. I like the institution because they give you the tools and the resources to do filmmaking. But when it came to actual classes and, and like, OK, well, you're going to tell me something, but it's not the gospel truth. It's not a Bible. Like, so let me can I uh, can I counter what you're saying? Because what if you do it this way? I would argue a lot. And I would. So it gets me in trouble when I argue with people. But.
Oh, that's great. That's that's. I think no, I think it's great that you had all that experience as an actor because it allows you to empathize with them, put yourself in their shoes. Like maybe you can feel what they're feeling when they're going through something, or you can kind of get a read. I think it enables you to get a read on what they're going through or how they're reacting to something. So you can communicate. So you can communicate with them better. Any kind of experience and any other aspect of filmmaking is is essential and, and helpful. But no, that, that's great. And I've heard very similar things from people before too. And it totally makes sense because I think like the more, well, you know, they say like half of it is just like the casting or half of the directing is just like the casting is, is the is a thing you hear a lot. And I think that's true because I think like the more that you the, you say probably the, like the more they get confused or tripped up in their own head or whatnot. And plus yeah. it, allows, it allows them to do most of the work themselves. It takes it off of you as well too, so. Yeah, um, the one thing I didn't point on is with directors talking a lot and stuff, um, they do that, it's, it's not just, they do that because they're scared or they don't feel adequate. That's why they need, feel, they feel the need to, to talk a lot. Like, oh, I'm walking, I, I'm directing an A-list actor right now. I'm going to talk, 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 because I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable with my uh, position but i guess what i said with joseph lopez earlier he's just sitting down in the chair calm just observing everything people come to him so yeah i i think but that's why directors do that that's why anyone in general does that like if you're if you're over analyzing or over talking with people it's coming from need like Oh, I, I'm scared. I, I don't belong here. I don't know what to do. So, so I'm just, and that's the other thing with takes. Like if the director doesn't know what to do, uh, I don't know if I, if I do it. Uh, uh, oh. The easiest thing for a director to do is, okay, I, I need to structure myself. Okay, well, okay, let's just do it again. Let's just do another take. But no, like it, I want to get the crew moving as fast as possible. So if I have it, I'm always going to do a safety because you never know, but there are times where if I just do one take properly, okay, let's move on. Even if it takes 30 minutes to light it, if it's good, I know as an editor and I'm looking through the monitor, like if it looks good, I check with the DP, do you have any problems with this? I think I also have pretty good relationships with my DPs just because I trust that process. Um, I'm not gonna rush them at the same time. I don't want it to take two hours to light a shot, but you know, I'm never going to just be like, okay, okay, let's go. We're good. Like, I'm going to check and be like, okay, are you happy with it? All right, let's move on. And then if they set up the shot, they do it in one take and it's done, they move on, then the crew's happy because I it, I don't want to see crew people just sitting around, you know, drinking sodas, just waiting because I'm doing take seven. So. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. So going along with uh, the filming thing, just uh, like one or two more questions here. Um, so. Uh, now that you've done several movies, what are the biggest pros and cons of being an independent filmmaker? Um, the pro is that you're not, uh, you don't have any rules to follow and you can mess up spectacularly, um, such as, I wouldn't say this was a spectacular failure, but I, like I said earlier, I think I failed more than I succeeded. However, there's a lot of good learning lessons to you know, go into the next one. It's just, you know, preparation um, and, you know, preparation, casting, there's a myriad of things. However, like it's a pro that I don't have a studio behind me that's like breathing down my neck for, oh, hey, here's 20, it's $20 million, $20 million. Like it's my own money. And I think a lot of independent filmmakers, they put their own money into it. So, you're only your own boss. Um, I do have distributors for this movie, but the way the distribution system works, they're gonna make their money back regardless. If the money trickles back to me, great. If not, you know, I'm gonna move on, film something else. And I think the lower budgets help to allow that, that it's a pro that you can trip up, you can try to make a slam dunk and you just hit the pavement on your way up to make the dunk and it's in it's an independent movie as well so you know hopefully if you do miss the mark by a lot that a lot of people aren't like watching you do that um so you can you there's a lot of redemption and, and, and there's also a lot of room for growth and i could have made the same movie 
I, I could have done the same exact things, change up a few things and get a different result like with cooking. So, and if you can do 10 independent movies, I would rather do 10 independent movies than one like million dollar movie because there's so much pressure and okay, this is it. You know, you, you can't do reshoots. Like I did two reshoots on this. If I wanted to fund a third, I could have. It's just at that point, it was um, early 2021. It's like, I think I have all the pieces I need here. So there's no reason to, you know, bring people back. Let's like get this wrapped up in a bow and, and move on. So I, yeah, and I think especially with like Marvel movies now, like um, I think I would echo a lot of sentiments. Like they're reshooting tons and tons of stuff. And the, like the latest, uh, the Rise of Skywalker, latest Star Wars movie, like they had 30 minutes, an hour of extra material that they're reshooting like two, three years into production. And who am I to criticize some of these esteemed producers or people that are, you know, I'm not, not going to get a Star Wars job. I'm not going to get a Marvel job, but it must be terrible to be like, you have a two hour movie or a 90 minute movie. Okay. What's going to work. All right. Let's get story. And, oh, but we're going to cut this sequence. We're going to cut this. We're going to cut this. Let's reshoot this. Like I've heard about all the terrible things happening on the recent Indiana Jones movie. Like it's oh, yeah. supposed to be soon, but like they're completely cutting sequences. They're changing characters. They're like there, there's multiple, like John Williams said, he, oh, I think we're shooting another ending. It's like they put stuff in test screenings that is absolutely awful. And then people, you know, oh, okay, let's, let's reshoot half the movie. Let's do this. Let's do this. Well, like what's the, the latest thing I heard is like, like, like making fun of Harrison Ford's age. Like uh, the original script had tons of stuff about his age. Ha ha ha. Isn't it funny? Harrison Ford's old. Like, no. And now it's all being taken out. So yeah, that's a, that's a pro of independent movies. The con is probably the, 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 the easy thing to say is that because it's an independent movie, you have so much flexibility and leeway the budgets are going to be terrible. Like if it's an independent movie, it's you're not going to have the big distributors to push it. Like Indiana Jones 4, Marvel movie 20, 70,000 X. Like it's going to be in 3000 theaters. People are going to buy it. There's going to be fancy Blu-rays. There's a ton of talent in all of the big budget productions. So the talent's going to filter down somewhere, even with all of the reshoots, even with all the struggles with like the canceled Star Wars projects, canceled, like mm. everything that has been going on recently with, I, I go back to Marvel and Star Wars just because that's what I love, like Star Trek, Star Wars, all these things. That's what I grew up with. That's what I love. But it's, yeah, like with the talent is there. But it, I'm rambling, but you see what I'm saying? Like that, it's a absolutely, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Independent movies that you, if you fail spectacularly in an independent movie, all the attention's on you. Like the negative comments, the negative reviews, everything is on you, and you have to be um, flexible enough to take it because it's just you. Like I financed this, I wrote it, I directed it, I thankfully did not act in it. I think it would have been a huge hubris for me and a lot of other like independent filmmakers to be like, I'm going to act in my own movie. Like, no, no, no. I know I'm not a good actor. Let me put other people in this, but I did produce, write, direct finance, blah, blah, blah. I found the distributor in the pictures. So any negative criticism, of course, it's all going to come back on me. When you do a big budget production, I could be the fifth director on whatever. And there's going to be shiny packaging on it. You know that a certain amount of people are going to buy it. And yeah, but you, you kind of, uh, yeah, I'm rambling again, but it, it's a, that, that's a con that for independent movies, you don't have a blanket. You don't have a warm, nice blanket of a studio that mm -hmm. will shield you from, like you can make the worst, I'm sure the new Andy, Indiana Jones movie is going to be terrible, but there's going to be a nice warm blanket over all of them with the press and everything that, oh, we know it's terrible. Like the, the, the 2016, I think it is the 2016 Ghostbusters. Like, yeah. Terrible, terrible. Like <laughs> I like I wanted like, and it has nothing to say with, uh, oh, 
you just replace them with women and, and oh, you're sexist and blah, blah. No, like it wasn't, it wasn't good. Like you can have great comedians, great director, great, like, but the choices that were being made. Yeah. And again, who am I to criticize all this? But what I'm trying to say is you, you that is a spectacular failure, but, and, and yeah, they canceled the sequels and all the other, but the actual movie itself, I'm sure it made money. And there's a warm, nice blanket over everyone involved. Um, yeah. And that doesn't happen with independent filmmaking. And I think independent directors, they have to be supremely thick skinned because there's going to be a lot of trolls that will be like, oh, one star is terrible. I hope they did good on their school project. Blah, blah, blah. Like oh, the amount of work that went into the, uh, I had this finished in a year and a half. So basically, um, from the end of COVID to middle of 2021. Like this film was basically done in June or so of 2021. Um, and, you know, it takes a while for independent movies to get out there, to get released. Like there are issues with the 5-1 mix. There were issues with distribution, where to go with blah, blah, blah. And I'm one guy, so I'm trying to communicate with people. And yeah, like, I guess uh, when you say pros and cons, yeah, I going in off on a tangent but yeah when there's only one guy if people don't respond to your emails what do you do like okay well i guess i'll just wait my time and hope that things work out for the best i'm sure if it's big budget movies you're getting phone calls and emails constantly because the money and the pressure is on you 24 7. and i'm saying this from a directing standpoint i'm assuming the directors of all these movies are you know basket cases they have to go in mental asylums by the end of it and the few <laughs> that can survive yeah like the um the, the the russo brothers did amazing work with endgame and all that stuff and why aren't they working on more marvel movies like uh, part of my work with netflix was doing a lot of the trailers and stuff for the gray man last year the netflix movie was it great i think it was fine but like what they do really well they like that's an example of people that I think have gone past the system. And it's like, all right, fine, fuck you, Marvel. You, why don't they still work with people that work because of politics, yeah. and whatever? But okay, fine, I'll just go off and do my own thing. Yeah, I, I think it's a it, it's a, what, what I'm boiling down to try to say is there's a it's big it's a big corporation and those movies are going to make money regardless. However, the yeah. returns have gone down a lot to the point where, oh shit, maybe we can't make another Star Wars movie. Let's just do the TV shows that work. Oh shit, like three over four TV shows don't work. I can go off on a Star Wars tangent, like Andor, amazing. Like they kind of fucked up um, Rogue One a bit. Just do whatever, do whatever they want. Like that, that's kind of like, okay, Andor, smaller budget, everything about that works. But oh, like a lot of the other stuff, not so much. Um, yeah. Oh, I feel yeah. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is great. Like that, you gave a lot of cool info for indie filmmakers. And um, so, one last question here, and then let us know where we can find you know, the third guest, and then like the rest of your work and upcoming stuff and all that. If you were able to go into a time machine, knowing what you know now, and do everything all over again as an independent filmmaker, what would you do differently? about about this film oh just like um anything in general related to independent filmmaking um i mean knowing what i know now i think certain choices in relationships i would obviously not make um but it's hard to say like you have to go into it being you, you have to go into relationships and productions with an open mind and just not take things too personally I wouldn't change much because all of the, I'm 41. I think that I've done a fair amount in the past, but I think my potential has not nearly been realized yet. But I think that the, what I've gone through in the past has helped me so that I don't have a high, high, and I write something bad on Twitter or uh, I bad mouth my distributor or do something that, you know, it's not helpful. So I think going back, like admitting to your failures and 
just be happy with your failures because and learn from them. I, I keep making the same mistakes over and over again, but I make them less and less severe. So yeah, I, I would just say, like, I, I wouldn't really change much. Like the filmmaking techniques and stuff you get with experience and how you talk to people, I think just comes with age and maturity. And everyone has different skill sets, like I was talking about before. I think my skill set is like a slow, slow rise. I have a video thing here. But yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, just like owning your mistakes and not being mad about what people comment on. I think that there's a lot of good people that did a lot of good work on this one, just like with American High School. And, you know, the best is yet to come for people that like own their faults and try to correct them and just just do good work because i would say like most independent filmmakers like there's probably 2000 plus hours of just personal work i did on this um from the editing color sound driving around los angeles like trying to take meetings with people um delivering hard drives you know being on set for 12 plus hours a day, like scheduling reshoots, doing, trying to do some kind of budgeting, getting a good deal. Um, well, we shot most of this in Idlewild. I, I guess any, if there's any kind of tips, I would say most people try to go to Big Bear or uh, when they go to the Big Mountains, but Idlewild is kind of near Palm Springs in the, the um, still east, but it's an amazing place to film. Like no one, like we had maybe one incident the entire shoot where someone from the population came by, oh, what are you doing? No, no, no. But like not a lot of people film there, but it's because it's not a ski town, but it's an amazing location. All the drone stuff that we got, the, the house was, we just got through Airbnb. Um, I looked around for like 20 different homes. The home that we got, I think looks great. Um, it's like has a seventies aesthetic, um, so a lot of these homes in Idlewild, they have themes and, and stuff like there, there's one house called like the doll house and it's a mm-hmm. house with dolls, like super creepy. Like yeah. that in the end of this, um, but I didn't, sh- I wasn't able to show the rest of the ho- house because on that particular day we were there for half a day and then we had to shoot other stuff. Um, but yeah, Idlewild, I would definitely check out. It begins with an I, um, Idlewild. I would, yeah. Like it's kind of like, like my little secret right now because I've done two films there so far. Um, and yeah, the town is great. has a nice town center. It has a lot of nice hiking trails up in the mountains. So I'll definitely be shooting there more. It, it's, a, it's a great location, great setting for horror films. Oh, that's awesome. That's all that, yeah, that was, that was a ton of great advice that you gave for aspiring filmmakers. So um, where can we find, uh, where can people find uh the third guest and then the rest of your work as well too, or just any kind of like link to your work. Yeah. So if you just Google Sean Patrick Cannon and I'm spelled like Sean Connery, um, S E A N. So Sean Patrick Cannon. And if you just Google my name, um, I think my IMDb, my LinkedIn, my Instagram, all this stuff comes up. Uh, third guest is available on Google play, YouTube, Vudu. I want to say it's like five different streaming services and I'm hoping that that will expand after the Blu-ray DVD release. Um, but yeah, it also, if you just Google the third guest on the right hand tab, um, all the platforms it's on are, are listed there. So I think it's only like three ninety nine to rent. Yeah, cool. All right. So, Oh, thank you so much for doing this, Sean. Uh, it was great talking to you. It was, that was a great conversation. Um, so we've been talking with Sean Patrick Cannon, writer and director of the third guest and Thank you for listening. And until next time, if you get an all expenses paid trip and a job to a cabin with a history of hauntings, maybe weigh your options and take a chance at the Motel 6 instead. Although if you did that, it would make for a a less creepy horror movie.